Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My apologies for the delay. Uh, I had to come in for the West. I'd like to thank the organizers for organizing the trip back. I literally had to climb mountains and go through rain and water to be here. Uh, but it is a pleasure to be here. Um, we've, we've had this forum now for about two or three years uh, in a row. And um, I think generally the theme has been that um, uh, it's an opportunity uh, to exchange views and perhaps uh, point out to government and various regulatory bodies as to where they are not perhaps doing their job or how better they can do their jobs. Um, I'd like to um, today, however, uh, perhaps do something that I haven't done before and actually show you some statistics uh, to put it all into perspective. Uh, and of course there's a recognition of the fact that uh, there's a, a number of areas in which we can improve, uh, both uh, administratively and also in terms of the regulatory framework. But I think it's about time also that uh, uh, we should use these sessions not simply to uh, point out, as, as important as it is, the, the problems, but also for us to come together in a very different and collaborative framework. Because, you know, we always talk about uh, places like Singapore, etc. <coughs> But everybody, uh, right from the uh, president to the prime minister to the private sector in particular, uh, trade unions, all different stakeholders have a adherence to or subscribe to the idea of brand Singapore. And there are sessions held where people in fact come together as opposed to bringing their own sectorial or segment problems, but actually sit down together and say how best we can improve and project Singapore as a country. We need to have those sessions. And I hope that we can turn this uh, forum this today into one of those sessions also. Because I think that is very, very critical. And as I will point out to you, uh, some of the challenges that we have as government also and also some of the regulatory uh, bodies have uh, as a challenge. But let me put that into perspective. Um, if I could have the first slide uh, on. Uh, which is the, the fiscal framework um, for the past number of years. As you can see, the, the revenue that, that's generated uh, or that has been generated for 2013-2014 as a percentage of GDP, uh, that's about 28.2 and 29.6 respectively, and the projected um, revenue for this year is 35.9%. Expenditure, uh, of course, it has always been more than our revenue, that's why we're in deficit. Uh, as percent of GDP is 28.8, 33.9, and 38.3 uh, for uh, this year projected. Net deficit, 2014 was 4.2. This year projected net deficit is 2.5 percent. There are the debt levels that we have as percent of GDP. Of course, it's been coming down overall, uh, as opposed to what you hear uh, in the street talk or social media talk. That, ladies and gentlemen, are the facts. And these are the figures. <coughs> we can move on to the next slide. So the revenue expenditure, if you look at the revenue, and I'll go into more detail in terms of taxation. So revenue overall, the sources of revenue is tax, non-tax. Uh, you've got overall a non-tax revenue for this year projected 206 million. Tax revenue is 2.5 billion. And in terms of the expenditure, uh, for uh, 2014, operating was 1.7, capital was 930 million. For this year, operating is 1.9, but capital you can see an enormous increase, a 1.3 billion. Um, VAT, standard 75.6, net deficit overall, again, its percent of GDP is 2.5 percent. Can go to the next slide, please? Funding for roads and jetties. Uh, this, of course, includes things like footpaths, street lighting, bridges also. You can see the enormous uh, amount of, um, uh, both as a percentage of the overall expenditure, uh, overall budget, and also in terms of nominal amount. You can see it's jumped from $521 million to $654 million this year. And if you compare that to, say, 2010, uh, it's increased by almost five or six fold. And there's of course now a legitimate expectation, not just by businesses, but the general community as a whole, to carry on with this work program. Everybody now talks about improving the roads. 
there is a legitimate expectation now because of the expectation that has been created by, uh, through the funding that their roads will get sealed, better roads will take place, better drainage infrastructure will take place. Uh, next slide, please. Funding for education. Now, you can see nominal terms has increased, in fact, quite substantially. 2010 was 312 million, now it's 556 million dollars. Overall, as a percentage of overall spend, is decreased because of the enormous percentage uh, hike uh, as far as roads and jetties and bridges are concerned. Nonetheless, it's $556 million, over half a billion dollars is now being spent in education. Of course, that includes things like the technical colleges that are being set up. And as I mentioned to the garment industry the other day, this technical college offers actually free courses in various areas. In other words, preparing the workforce or the labor force for a particular industry. So, for example, there are four-week uh, uh, sewing clothes, classes made available for free for people who want to attend these courses. Now, what does that mean, uh, the impact on the business? So, the garment industry does not have to take somebody afresh from the street and actually spend money in training them. They already have had four weeks of training. So, it reduces the cost of your business. That's what government is doing. There are various other areas that I can uh, talk about also. But that's where that uh, funding for education, of course, for education, it means every single Fijian child has the ability now to go on to Form 7, which means you have a better crop of people available for you to take in the workforce. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> funding for electricity and water. Now, uh, electricity also includes rural electrification, which includes extension of the grid around Viti level. It also includes specific projects. It also includes, um, you know, the outer island electricity, the solar panels, etc., that are being put on. But also the you know, very substantial increase uh, for uh, allocation to Water Authority of Fiji, which uh, I, it's about 180 million dollars, uh, operating and capital combined. You know what's like. So again, uh, you are, we are providing amenities two areas that did not have those amenities. It increases business opportunities. It has a very direct impact, for example, on the workforce. Again, as I mentioned to the garment industry the other day, if you have some of your workers coming from squatter areas, or areas where they don't have running water, or areas where there weren't buses running because the roads weren't good, suddenly, if these people now have access to water, they have access to electricity, there are happier people coming to your work. The level of productivity increases. The level of absenteeism goes down. I'm trying to draw this to your attention because you need to understand when government is spending money, it is not simply money spent in isolation, we're simply building a road, but it has a multiply effect in terms of positive multiply effect for you as employers. And most of you in this room are employers or work for an employer organization. Next slide, please. Funding for health. <clears throat> Again, we recognize the fact that uh, the health sector is one of those sectors that really needs an enormous leapfrogging into providing full tertiary care. In Fiji at the moment, we do not have full tertiary care available 24-7. And that is one of our biggest challenges. Nonetheless, we have over the years, as you can see, increased the funding uh, for uh, health uh, nominal terms, of course, is in continuously increased. Uh, you know, sometimes those figures are a bit uh, uh, out of whack in the sense because our GDP, of course, is increased. But uh, nominal term, two hundred seventy million dollars and eight point one uh, percent of the overall spend of of, uh, of the budget. Our industry and trade programs. We thought we'd just put that into perspective in terms of the assistance we are providing. Tourism marketing grant, as you know, is twenty three point five million. Investment Fiji grant is increased to 2 million uh, this year. Export strategy has been increased to 2 million again this year. Commerce Commission grant, uh, some of you will probably be happy that the grant has been reduced. Uh, small and medium enterprise grant, that's a new uh, initiative which is a million dollars uh, this year. And as you know that we've actually spent more than a million dollars now. Uh, in, in fact, it's about, I think, already three million dollars, about three million dollars. And that is a wonderful initiative, and in fact, it has taken root very well. And in fact, now we're being asked 
for it to continue on a yearly basis. Very basically, we don't actually give people money. So somebody who has, you know, in the village of Namatakula, which you probably drive all the way past every time you drive to the west, and they've got a pigsty. They're doing well. Now, they're making money out of it, but in order for them to increase the size of the pigsty, they need that capital, which they don't have, which they then can get through this $1,000 grant. It's all assessed. The funding is actually given, channeled through Fiji Development Bank, but they're not given the money. And the supply is identified. You need your 4 by 2 timber or fencing, whatever it is required. A supply is identified and a check is made out to the supplier for that specific supplier for those materials. So suddenly this person now can rear two or three more pigs or chickens or goats or the lady who's selling handicraft at the Outrigger Hotel has suddenly now got more raw material to be able to more, make more you know, jewelry or whatever uh, they make. And that's actually working quite well. Um, Film PG, uh, the grant has remained the same. As you know, we've got very attractive uh, uh, rebates uh, for that. We've recently, uh, through Parliament, amended the amount that you could claim as rebate now um, in terms of your production spend. Uh, Next Med has basically remained the same. Uh, Fijian Made by Fijian Campaign, which again is very successful and assists many of your businesses. And it inculcates a sense of patriotism and a sense of allegiance to products made in Fiji that is very, very critical. Uh, uh, TCF Council, it should be Council of Fiji, uh, we've been giving this now for the past number of years uh, for them to help them in their marketing uh, strategy and the trade policy framework of $60,000. Uh, of course, if you include um, uh, the grant that we give now for the uh, Fiji and the golf tournament, and that's not shown here too, uh, but that's in, the, in about uh, six to eight million dollars that's been allocated for that. Uh, it televised, I understand, from about 400 million people actually watch this tournament. So your marketing um, ability is enhanced enormously. I'd like to go on to the, uh, very quickly, because it provides uh, uh, some material for me to be able to talk about some of the other issues, is the other slide. Would you like to show you the breakdown of the revenue that we do get? <clears throat> Income tax collection. What's our source of revenue? 2014, these are actuals. PAYE, 139 million. Withholding and dividend tax, 84 million. Company tax, only $207 million. Other sales, sole traders, partners, 26 million. Provisional tax, 10. Other miscellaneous tax is 3 million. Branch profit remittance, 1.4. Uh, billion, uh, ACT, uh, ICT, sorry, business license fee is uh, 4125. Tourist vet refund registration fee 227,000. Yacht registration 268,000. Gross revenue is that. Less your refunds and less the film rebates if you go up. Total net income $446 million. But out of that, let me just, uh, if you can slightly go up, please. <coughs> Company tax is $207 million. That's one of the, uh, the highest amounts, but not, our view is that it's not very much. If you go down, value added tax, customs import VAT, 560 million, domestic VAT, 517 million, other government departments, 24 million, VAT collection, your refund of 303 million, <coughs> less tourist VAT refund, 3.8 million, total net VAT collection is $794 million. Capital gains, $43 million last year. Service turnover tax, 57. Stamp duty, 68 million. Social responsibility tax, 7.7 million. <coughs> Telecommunications levy is 1.2 million. Credit card levy is 3.8 million. Third party insurance levy, 1.9. Fringe benefit tax is 18 million. Fiscal duty, 365 million. Import excise 43, excise duty 98, export duty 9.9, luxury vehicle levy is $2.2 million. <coughs> and uh, then you have your gross customs collection, less rebates, $513 million, which many would argue is not as much as it should be. And there is a problem with under declaration of the value of the goods that come into Fiji.
and the figures we see are show, are show, notwithstanding the fact that we are on a growth path, notwithstanding the fact that internal VAT collection has increased, and as you know, the substantial portion of our sales in Fiji is sourced from overseas products, that there has not been a commensurate increase in VAT income from importation. And that is a problem. Uh, resource tax, $34 million, as you know, that's predominantly water. Uh, departure tax is $122 million. Fish levy is 438000 Overall net revenue collections is $2.1 billion. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> that's just to um, bring home the point in terms of what dollars and, some, what dollars and, uh, and cents we are talking about in terms of what government has to deal with and what it has to then provide vis-a-vis -vis the collection. As I mentioned earlier on, that I'd, I'd like to you know, talk today about some of the key issues uh, that I think is relevant for our discussions, and hopefully that we'll be able to uh, uh, talk about these issues a lot more in detail. But essentially, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are on a trajectory that we need to take advantage of. As you know, we have had unprecedented growth rates in excess of 4%. Over the past three years, we've had growth rates in excess of for the past five or six years. And we have been able to do so when uh, there was a lot of negativity around, when there were various bans in place, put in place by our friends in Australia and New Zealand in, in, in particular, that also limited our ability to source from a wider pool of people to be able to carry out many of the reforms that we wanted to carry out including from the civil service to state-owned enterprises and various other institutions generally. So what has led to that success? I think fundamentally it was more of a vision to see how we can best work with our resources that we have been given and also to be able to identify that there are very strength and strengths and weaknesses that we have, a comparative advantage if you like. So for the next few years, we as government are solely focused on, of course, improving efficiencies. We have put in place, as you know, an ICT program in terms of uh, providing better government services through um, uh, you know, uh, electronic form. As you would have uh, read in the papers a couple of days ago, the Permanent Secretary for Itauke Affairs has now said that the digitization of all the uh, members of the land owning units has been completed now. Now, what that means is that we are now on a completely new uh, level of uh, data uh, collection and data retention. It also helps in the equal distribution of land lease monies. We will very soon be, for example, starting the digitization of the titles office in, in Fiji. We are told that if we employed uh, about 60 to 80 people and uh, had them working in three shifts 24-7, we can complete the digitization by November or December of this year. The software is already being developed in terms of what you do with new applications, but at the same time we have this digitization that is critically essential. Because with titles, some of the titles go back to 1864, 1874, and they're basically falling apart. So we need to ensure that we need, need to maintain the integrity of the documentation and have that digitized, and then of course you'll be able to then hopefully by the middle of next year sit uh, in your offices and be able to do title searches and pay online. Uh, as you know that uh, with Investment Fiji now we have a one window application with the four tier agencies where people can sit any part of the world, pay their levy, uh, pay their fee, sorry, and make that application and get the approval from the four tier agencies. So, um, similarly, we'll be uh, with the Companies Act. As you know, there's a lot of people are asking questions at the moment. When will the new Companies Act come into effect? As you know, the Companies Act has already been approved by Parliament. We have, uh, we're in the process of finalizing the regulations because you need the regulations in place. One of the issues that has been identified is that some of the forms that are part of the registration is not necessarily digital friendly. So we are working at the moment with ADB together with the drafters 
to be able to ensure that those forms become digital friendly. So you can then lodge those forms online. We don't want a situation where we, for example, have the commencement of the Companies Act, but we don't have any of these ducks all lined up. They all need to be lined up. So we are hoping to have the new Companies Act. Please don't hold me to it at the moment because ADB is here and I'm looking at them and put pressure on them. We had a meeting with them yesterday. We are hoping that the new Companies Act will come into effect from 1 Jan 2016. And uh, that, is, that is our target. So, ladies and gentlemen, a number of other initiatives are being undertaken. And we, we hope to obviously um, ensure that uh, uh, the, the ease of doing business, uh, the rating of Fiji does increase. You know, it was very interesting because this does get, you know, rolled out to us. And I understand in, the, in the, uh, one of the committees in Parliament, people making submissions were talking about, well, the ease of doing business in Fiji is not very good. But let me tell you, we actually asked the World Bank and said, who are the people you surveyed? to find out or assess what is the ease of doing business in Fiji. And out of the 30 respondents, 30 odd respondents, about seven or eight were lawyers from one particular law firm. So if that particular law firm does not necessarily like what government is doing, what do you think the result will be? We had accounting firms that they have two or three partners from one accounting firm. You had a logistics company where you had two or three respondents who were from the same logistics company. So we don't necessarily believe that the ease of doing business uh, uh, survey has that level of integrity. But nonetheless, nonetheless, we obviously want to improve the rating that we have. And we are hoping and we are talking to World Bank that when they do get respondents, they get a cross-section of the business community in Fiji to be able to get a much better and true and accurate representation about the ease of doing business in Fiji. One of the reasons why I've showed that to you, ladies and gentlemen, is that at the moment, the taxation system in Fiji, in particular with VET, is regressive. And we need to be able to address it. And I'll tell you why it's regressive. The reason why, for example, the six or seven basic food items were made VET exempt was to ease the cost of basic food items to those people on the lower end of the socioeconomic scale. That's the philosophy behind it. But most of you in this room can actually afford to pay VAT for those items, but you're also not paying VAT for those items. That's why it's regressive. So any assistance to those people at the lower end of the socioeconomic scale must be targeted specifically. And that is one of our challenges. Because otherwise you are then actually misappropriating government funds because it is not targeted. A person earning eighty, ninety thousand dollars three hundred thousand dollars a person earning a million dollars in Fiji is also not paying VAT when they go and buy tea and flour and what have you, when they can afford to pay VAT or even more than what they're paying VAT at 15 percent. And that's a problem. That's a challenge for us to be able to fix that up without, without marginalizing those people who actually deserve it. So the challenge for us is how best do we address it to target those people who actually do deserve it and perhaps even increase the targeted assistance. Increase the targeted assistance in terms of the gambit of the people who need to be receiving those assistance, assistance needs to be increased plus also the value of the assistance needs to be increased also. In Fiji, of course, one of the major challenges we have is that there are fundamentally three categories of people we have to deal with. You have people who are social welfare recipients. They're quite easy. You target them. You know who they are. And if you want to increase it, you can directly assist them. But a substantial portion of people are actually in the informal sector. They're neither welfare recipients nor are they employed in the, formally as an employee. So again, when you're driving down to Nandi or Lutoka, for example, if you stop in Korovislo, I normally stop there and drink coconuts, and I talk to those people. Sometimes he says he makes $200 a week. Sometimes, depending on the weather, he may make $50 a week. On a good day, he may, on a good week, he may make $250. But 
these are the people that we also have to keep in mind. Because there is no way of actually capturing them through some form of registration unless we go out specifically and register them. The Reserve Bank talks about financial inclusion. The whole idea is to capture that pool of people also. So in terms of targeted assistance, when we want to carry out targeted assistance, we have to think about this category of people. It's very critical. The third category, of course, are those people who are in, you know, in, uh, employed as employees formally. They, they uh, registered with the TIN number, and you know, as you know, that we've uh, increased the income tax threshold from $8,400 to $16,000. So when we are talking about fixing up the anomalies in the taxation system, one of government's challenges is to be able to ensure that we do not leave anybody behind, nor do we unfairly discriminate against people. We can quite you know, objectively uh, discriminate against those people who have lots of money. That's the whole idea of progressive taxation. But we cannot objectively discriminate against those people who don't have much. We have to keep that in mind. The anomaly also, ladies and gentlemen, leaves the room open for leakages. And I'm being very polite when I say that. Because it, by having this anomaly, we know, and this is perhaps one area that FERCA needs to uh, improve its capacity, that there are people stealing from the system. There is fundamentally a culture of dishonesty. I see some supermarket operators in the room. I'm not saying they're doing it. But there are some groceries and supermarket outlets that are actually rigging the system. And that's a fact. And that's a reality. And my appeal to you this morning is, as a business community, as people who are movers and shakers within the commerce sector in Fiji, we must develop an attitude where your sector must shame these people into doing the right thing. Somebody said to me last night when I was talking about this, they said, yeah, but you know, if FERCA's compliance capacity increased, then these people would not get away with it. But that should not be any excuse for dishonesty. We have one of the lowest taxation rates for companies in this part of the world, 20%. 20%. 10% for listed companies, 17.5% for companies that set up a regional or global head office in Fiji. Very favorable terms. We have increased the income tax threshold from 8400 to 16000 For the employers, we have helped you give your employees a pay rise. I don't know how many businesses have thought about it that way. We have helped you give your employees a pay rise. Less pressure on you. Government now gives free medicine, people earning less than 20,000. Free water for household less than, earning less than 30,000. Free education, a TELS program. What does this mean? It means that the people who previously had to fork that money out of their pocket no longer have to do that. So they have more money in their pocket, which means they can spend that money. So those of you may own Chicken Express or own a takeaway place, you'll find more people doing buying that. It's a fact. I go and speak to Chicken Express people sometimes. And the guy said to me, boss, I don't know where these people get their money from. My chicken finishes by 3 o'clock. But that's the impact. So I really need the business community to be able to think that these uh, initiatives that government has it's not something that is confined to the person receiving the benefit. It's actually a benefit for all of you. In the same way as I said to the tourism industry and to the garment industry the other day, that you also have to be concerned about social development in Fiji. You have to support things like the domestic violence law. If majority of the workers in a hotel are women, if majority of the workers in a garment factory are women, and there are now laws that deter people, and as you know, most people who are the victims of domestic violence are women, if now there are laws that deter them from being bashed up, what do you think will happen to your productivity levels?
it will of course increase. If she's being bashed up the night before at home, her willingness to come to work is diminished. Even if she does come to work, her mind, mentally, physically, emotionally, she won't be there. So it affects your business too. So this is why it's very critical, as I said at the CPA conference last year, that unfortunately in Fiji, and I'm having a go at all of you now, unfortunately in Fiji, that many people do not necessarily, professionals, accountants, lawyers, business uh, organizations, do not necessarily think that it is their, their, in their purview to actually make statements in the public space. Saying, look, we believe that this law is good. You can say that objectively. They do not say that this initiative is good because it puts less pressure on us, it's good for the community overall. We all need to be, if we want to be where Singapore is, or Mauritius, some people may argue, we all need to participate in the public space to be able to contribute to these kind of initiatives and inculcate that sense of what our Honourable Prime Minister keep on saying, keeps on saying is about that one nation building that one nation, because everybody will benefit from it. Your businesses will benefit from it. Your employees will benefit from it. So it's very, very critical, ladies and gentlemen, that we get that sense of branding Fiji, not just in the sense of you know, Fiji and May, but also in terms of psychologically, what we can all do to contribute, because ultimately we all benefit from it. Now, I have uh, uh, highlighted uh, earlier on to when we met with the different uh, sectors within the, within the community about the, uh, you know, the initiatives that government is undertaking. I accept the fact that uh, in some of the areas that, uh, of course, we can improve quite significantly. Um, as you know, that uh, the public service is going through a, a reform. The chairman of the Public Service Commission is here. Um, they are in the process of uh, uh, you know, advertising uh, for the selection of uh, new permanent secretaries. We have, we are with the World Bank, we are working with the World Bank and various other consultants and we hope to in the next uh, month or so roll out some standard operating procedures across the ministries uh, regarding, for example, merit-based appointments, regarding disciplinary of uh, actions uh, and ensuring that uh, there is consistency in the selection criteria uh, across all the ministries. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we do have a, a significant challenge. We have a very young population base. Uh, we do uh, need to be able to address issues like employment. We need to be able to put in place industries that can give them gainful employment to our younger population. In the last elections, in the 592,000 registered voters, over 200,000 were below the age of 32. There will be a lot more coming into that bracket again. So these are the people who are the future of Fiji and they'll very quickly become the dominant numbers. So our ability to put in place policies that will address the issues for the, those below the age of 40 is very, very critical. Our ability to be able to retain people in the rural areas and or make rural areas a lot more attractive for investment is very critical. In the same way, for example, when it became illegal for foreigners to buy freehold residential properties in urban areas, we are trying to target and uplift the value of Ethiopia land in Fiji. Many people are resistant to, for example, buying Ethiopia land leases I'm talking about, because they say, oh, it's not secure. We want to tell them they're secure. Most of the hotels are built on Ethiopia land. Banks lend to hotels large sums of money. The entire Denra, all the hotels are built on Ethiopia land. ANZ, Westpac, uh, lend to these businesses. So there is a there is a rationale behind it. It's also to make, for example, homes affordable <coughs> for ordinary Fijians. We must not let that out of the grasp. And in fact, we hope to make some announcements regarding the availability of housing. Uh, 200 features. Housing is a big issue for us. That's our next area that we want to tackle, affordable housing, and to be able to ensure that we have development in that area. Some of you would be shocked to see, and I've seen, uh, for example, footage, if you go to an ATM machine at 4 o'clock in the morning on payday, you'll actually see a couple of people uh, coming out in cars, 
traveling wearing probably beanies with this many ATM cards and with a book with all the pin numbers. These are, these are money lenders. So when you go and borrow money from a money lender, you have to give them your ATM card and your pin number. And then they come and withdraw the money. This is why we have long queues in the bank. Because if I give my ATM card to the money lender, so during the day that I come, I know it's payday, then I'll stand up and actually see how much money is withdrawn or she's withdrawn. And then I, you know, then I withdraw the funds manually over the counter. So these are very critical issues. And we hope to get more private sector interest in that. As you know, government recently, for example, advertised calling for expressions of interest for private sector uh, to build uh, uh, government offices. And we hope to uh, carry on with that particular project very soon and make some announcements in that area. We are also uh, providing assistance for the development of uh, Italia land for subdivision, which is very, very critical. Uh, you know, it is, it is quite shameful that in Fiji, for a number of decades, the people who actually make the cream out of subdivision of Italia land are not the Italia people themselves, but other developers who come along and lease those lands, 100, 200 acres, whatever it may be, or 50 acres, and then at a nominal rate, and then they will subdivide and sell those leases for eighty, ninety thousand, or one hundred fifty thousand dollars. We would like the Italian people to actually develop it themselves, and this is where government has set aside ten million dollars this year to be able to, for example, give them the funds by way of a grant to help connect them to amenities, so the cost of the production of their land for development purposes is reduced. So the number of initiatives I place, ladies and gentlemen, I think is very really critical uh, that uh, that we follow through with this. I'd like to, just, just very quickly, I mean, I, I think I've uh, probably said uh, enough, and as you know, that we've got many other sessions that are coming, uh, coming uh, up. I think, you know, just to, uh, to, to capture uh, this whole thing uh, about, uh, for example, uh, women or uh, being appointed to boards. I think, yes, I think you'll see that appointments are taking place. But there must be a fundamental philosophy here. It must be merit based. You must have merit-based appointments, otherwise you'll actually diminish that kind of positive uh, you know, discrimination. If you appoint people for the sake of appointing people without merit, then it will be quite detrimental to whichever organization you sit on the, on the board. So there must be a threshold that everybody needs to meet. And that is very, very critical. In most countries actually, that if you study that, they have actually suffered under that kind of positive discrimination. If you have merit-based appointments, if you meet the minimum threshold and you say, okay, these people have met the minimum threshold, and yes, okay, maybe there's some women that are not there, then we can put women in there. That's very, very critical. Because it then instills confidence. At the end of the day, the ordinary Fijian who goes across the government counter wanting to be served, they simply want to be served. They want that level of efficiency. As I said um, uh, last year, that uh, when we build roads, when there's no water in the tap, or the tap, the water stops running through the tap, nobody rings up and says, oh, can you fix up my tap water, and by the way, I want a person of this ethnic group, or this religious group, or a male or female to fix it. They just want the water in the tap. When there's no electricity, they want it fixed immediately. And who best can do that? The person who knows how to do it best person to do the job. And I think that is very, very critical for us to be able to understand that. In the same way, for example, some of the challenges that we have uh, you know, through the regulatory bodies, whether it's Maka, whether it's finance, whether it's uh, industry and trade, whether it's uh, municipal council, whether it's town and country planning, whether it's the lands department, uh, and I know these are some of the key target areas that you'll probably be talking about later on in the day today, we need to have the best people to do the job. Last but not least, I would like to uh, uh, highlight again that uh, we do have some challenges in terms of getting the right people uh, because of the lack of skill set that we have. As you know, for example, in Fiji, there's a shortage of surveyors. There's a shortage of town and country planners. This is why the scholarship that we are giving, the fully paid scholarship with 600 coppers in the corner, there's a number of positions reserved for that. Unfortunately, we don't have that many people who want to take up those scholarships. Because in Fiji, you know, every child is told that uh, by most parents that uh, to be successful, you have to become a lawyer or a doctor or perhaps an engineer. Nobody, you know, it's, it's not sexy to be a town planner or, or a surveyor. 
So we need to, of course, have that mind shift. In the same way that, uh, you know, somebody telling me that when they were in high school, when the student did not pay attention, they said, oh, you know, if you keep on not paying attention, you'll probably be, become a farmer. In many of the country schools, they actually say that. <coughs> that is wrong, because we want more farmers. We want more qualified farmers. This is why we're giving scholarships to the area. So it's a home. as a country, we need to make that mind shift. And my appeal to you today is, please understand, we need to take a collaborative approach. You also, as a group, need to be able to, if we are concerned about the future, need to be able to identify people within your sector who are rigging the system. I, I'm saying this again and again, because there is a huge amount of income leakage. There was a survey that was done that said that one third of the value of our GDP is in the black economy. So if you take today's figures of $8 billion, one third of that is about $2.5 billion, <coughs> unaccounted for. Not coming through FERCA, not coming through the tax the mainstream, RBF, through the banks. It's below us. Now you can imagine if the $250 billion is uncaptured, and even if you take 15% of that as revenue collection, that will significantly, significantly boost our ability to have more revenue that will significantly improve our ability to have perhaps a surplus budget. Significantly improve our ability to build more or invest more into infrastructure. I was talking to, again, um, because I just spoke to them, uh, you know, the, the, the garbage industry people, and one of them said that they felt really mandua about calling some of their clients to visit the factory because the road to the factory was filled with potholes. If the road is now fixed, when your airport is a modern airport, is a modern airport, when you have four men coming out of the airport, and you're bringing clients into Fiji to be able to market your product, you've already sold them. I mean, you've already sold half of it to them. Because it creates a very good impression of the country. We are helping you in marketing your products. We need efficiency through the system, we need better infrastructure. We are helping you market your products. So it's a collaborative approach. We do not do things in, in a vacuum. And that's the one message I could send to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak here. Uh, I will, uh, uh, of course, be uh, around and we can have those panel discussions. But thank you once again, and we look forward to talking to more of you. Now.